So, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up. Take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and, sorry. He began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teacher of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Great, thank you, Janelle, and well done for juggling the handheld mic and the Bible. It's not easy to do. Um, Keep that passage open in front of you, and I'm going to pray for us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that we meet you on the pages of Mark's Gospel. Thank you that you have made yourself known, and it is astonishing. It changes everything. It changes who we are. It changes where we're going. It changes what this life means. And we pray, Lord, that we might grasp that this afternoon. Amen. Well, I wonder whether anyone remembers who this is. Hopefully. Anyone remember who that is? It's uh, Susan Boyle. Uh, who back in 2009 uh, appeared on Britain's Got Talent. Uh, And she appeared before Simon Cowell and the other mocking judges. Uh, And as she got up there on a stage, she had this kind of awkward demeanour. And then this happened. most incredible voice, and she went on to to sell millions of records with her incredible voice. It was an astonishing performance. Uh, Some of us, uh, and by that I mean uh, my boys and I, uh, went to the Etihad yesterday to see this, what we thought would be an astonishing victory for Man City. But if you were lucky enough to watch that on Match of the Day, uh, you'll know that it uh, it ended up being an astonishing capitulation as City were humiliated uh, 2-0. Very, very sad indeed. And young people here, I wonder if you know who this is. Anyone know who that is? You're all too up. Oh, Etienne, you are truly young. Well done. (laughs) Or or you're a primary school teacher. It is indeed Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast of YouTube fame. And he's got loads of astonishing videos on YouTube. And perhaps the most astonishing is this one, where he gave a a pizza delivery man a $10,000 tip. It was astonishing. It was astonishing. 
Astonishing things are things that rock our world. And over the last month and a half, as we've been going through Mark's gospel, we've been seeing some astonishing things about Jesus. We've seen astonishing claims about who Jesus is, that Jesus is God himself walking on the earth. And we've seen astonishing things that Jesus has done. So we've seen him calling people with with kind of incredible magnetism. We've seen him casting out demons. We've seen him healing all sorts of diseases. And today, in Mark chapter 2, we're going to see four more astonishing things about Jesus. And the thing that makes each of these four things astonishing is that they rock the way we think about our world. They rock the way we think about our world. And the first thing we see here is astonishing faith. That's verses 1 to 4, astonishing faith. Jesus, he's been on a preaching tour of Galilee. Uh, We read about that back in verse 39 of chapter 1. But he's now returned to Capernaum, and we read here that he has, verse 1, he has come home. Now, that most likely refers to Simon Peter's house, the place where back in chapter 1, he'd healed Simon's mother-in-law. But but Jesus, even in spite of this great healing ministry, he's still in the business of preaching, and a huge crowd has gathered at this house, verse 2. There are so many people that the house is filled up, the, the door is full up, that the road leading up to the house is full. This is basically, it's Primark on Black Friday. Packed to the rafters. And that presents a problem for these five men we read about in verse 3. Four of the men, they are on foot. One man, the fifth, he's lying on a mat. He, he is paralyzed, unable to walk. And most probably, this, this gang of five, they've, they've been in hot pursuit of Jesus for days. They've been following him on this preaching tour around Galilee as Jesus was healing and preaching, healing and preaching, but they could never get to the front of the queue. But then now they finally caught up with Jesus. Je- Jesus has stopped. There's just one problem. In fact, it's more like a thousand problems. The thousand people that stand between them and Jesus. You can just imagine the sort of conversation between the four of them, can't you? That the more downbeat one says, oh, I knew it, I knew it, we would never be able to get to Jesus. We, you know, it was pointless in the first place, we should just give up and go home now. But then Benjamin who's a little bit more optimistic. He, he gives a knowing look to Samuel. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And they hatch this plan to go behind the back of the house and to go up on the spiral staircase that leads up to the roof of the house. Now, now first century Palestinian homes, most of them were just single-story buildings, and they would have a flat roof. And the roof would be built by, by getting uh, little bits of, of thatch, uh, combining it with mud, and then laying it across the timber crossbeams. Th- these roofs were sturdy things. Uh, they were used for storage. They were used to, to go and dry fruit on them. In hot summer nights, people would even go up onto the roof and sleep out there to keep cool at night. These were strong roofs. And so the four men, they carry their friend up onto the roof... And then they begin to pound on the thatch with a hammer. That's what we read in verse 4. And you can imagine the sight, can't you? They're getting excited. We're doing it. We're doing it. The dust starts to sprinkle down on all those listening to Jesus. Then after a while, the thatch and the masonry itself starts to plummet down into the house, narrowly missing Jesus' nose. And he's left with no option but to stop his sermon. Midpoint as this poor man is slowly lowered down on ropes before Jesus' eyes. Jesus, he looks up at the chances on the roof. Now, what do you expect him to be thinking at that moment in time? 
as a preacher, I'll tell you what would be normal to be thinking. What on earth are they doing interrupting me midpoint? But that, that is not what Jesus thinks. Look at verse 5. Jesus saw their faith. Their faith is plural. The faith of all five men. Jesus saw that faith, and that faith was astonishing. Astonishing. When you hear that word faith, I wonder what you think. I think many people today, they they associate faith with wishful thinking. They think that they themselves don't have faith, but they really admire other people who do have faith because it, it seems to make those other people's lives more, more, more livable. Other people, they, they see faith as simply being privatised belief. So I have my faith, you have your faith, and that's all okay, but let's keep it private, let's not talk about it. Deeply personal. Well, that is nothing like the faith that Jesus applauds in verse 5. There are three things for us to notice about this astonishing faith. Firstly, the faith is comprehensive, not partial. What do I mean? Well, consider what the government are currently doing with the COVID measures. They tell us that we are currently on plan A for winter COVID. And they say, that that's all right for the moment, but if things go bad, we'll have to move to plan B. I think people can treat faith in Christ a bit like that. So we start up with plan A. But plan A is, is trusting in ourselves to sort things out. Like trusting in ourselves to, to pass those exams or to, to find that spouse or to... Um, to get that job we really want. But if it goes wrong, if plan A of trusting in ourselves goes wrong, well, then we'll move to plan B, which is trusting in Christ to sort it all out when I can't. For these five men, Jesus is their plan A, their plan B, and their plan C. They followed him around for days, most likely. They're absolutely sure that he, and he alone, is able to help. That They have put all of their trust in him. Their faith, it is comprehensive, not partial. Secondly, it is compassionate, not personal. You see, these four men, they're not willing to keep their faith to themselves. It's not merely a personal thing, them and Jesus. No, they have a friend in need. They know the only one who can help is Jesus. Therefore, they are absolutely determined to bring their friend to Jesus. Their faith is compassionate, not personal. And thirdly, their faith is creative, not passive. What do I mean here? Well, faith for these four men, it wasn't simply about what they know up here in their heads. Faith wasn't simply affirming a whole range of theological doctrines. No, what they knew about Jesus drives them to incredible lengths to bring both themselves and their friend to Jesus' feet. They're creative. They hatched this plan to go up on the roof, to smash down the roof, to lower their friend on this mat, because they know, they know that he is everything. The sort of faith that Jesus sees, the sort of faith that Jesus applauds, it is active faith. It is faith that goes all in and trusts Jesus. So I need to ask you, is that your faith this afternoon? Is that the sort of faith you have in Jesus? That's astonishing faith. The second astonishing thing we see here is in verse 5, and it is an astonishing diagnosis. Jesus looks down at this helpless man who's now at his feet on this mat. Unable to move himself, Jesus looks him in the eye and he says, verse 5, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now you can just imagine that the hushed whisper amongst the gathered crowd, can't you? 
Um, Jesus, uh, I think you've missed the point. I mean, haven't you seen this guy? I mean, you know, having your sins forgiven, that's all good. Yeah, it has its place. But this guy's got a bit more of a pressing need. He's seen his leg. To which Jesus replies, no. No, I, I understand his problem. I understand them far better than anyone else does. I have been seeing these problems for years. I've seen his suffering, and I will get to that. But first, I want to address his biggest problem. I want to address his sin. Now, we we hear that word sin. And if... If we have the wrong understanding of what sin is, what Jesus says here is just utterly ridiculous. If we think sin is simply the wrong things that we do, like, you know, speeding on the motorway or or telling a white lie or being economical with the truth, if that's what we think sin is, then it's impossible to see how that is more serious than legs that don't work, which means you're permanently unemployed, never able to get married, never able to have any security in life. It just doesn't make sense. But those things, they are just the outworkings of sin. They're not the essence of sin. Sin, at its core, is not the things we do, It is who we are. Sin is not a state of affairs. Sin is a state of heart. It is the decision to cut ourselves off from the life source, the one who made us, the one one who cares for us, the one who gives us absolutely everything we need. It's a decision to say, I don't need you. I know what's best. I will live my life my way. Thank you very much. That is sin. It is fundamentally relational. And Jesus says that it is the biggest problem in our life. The the paralyzed man, he he thought that getting healed would sort out all of his problems. No doubt he thought, if only only my legs would work, I'd be happy again. Life would be all right. Everything else would just melt away. Life would be fine if my legs could work. But Jesus says, no, my friend, you are wrong. Because your problem goes much deeper than simply legs that don't work. You know, having all of your dreams fulfilled, that can be a profoundly discontenting experience. I mentioned Susan Boyle at the start. Another one of those reality TV show winners was James Arthur. Arthur swept a victory on the X Factor a decade ago, and and just a few weeks after his great victory, he he was interviewed about how he felt about having won the X Factor. Listen to what he said. He said, I felt depressed. I, I know it sounds really ridiculous. It's funny. You dream of this thing your whole life, and then when it comes, you're like, what do I do with it? What do I do? Getting everything you dream of can leave you feeling even more empty than you felt before. We all feel a hole, don't we? We all feel a a sense of unfulfilled desire. And we tell ourselves, if only I can pass the exams. If only I can get myself a spouse. If only I can get over this this illness or, or this depression. If only this can happen, then I'll be happy but we aren't, because we haven't gone deep enough to fill that hole. We haven't diagnosed our real problem. You know, a friend of mine uh, went to China with his wife. Uh, She'd worked out in China for a while, so so the idea was that she would take him back and and show him uh, where she spent three years working. And during their time in China, uh, they went on a cycle ride. They decided it would be great to ride bikes. They'd see China and all its beauty in the the rural areas. But but when they got back from the cycle ride, 
And my friend felt the top of his leg really, really hurting. And he felt a slight bump on it. He decided he'd just been cycling for too long, must be sad or sore, it'll go away, it'll be fine. But then they got back from China, and the pain was still there. So he went to the doctor, and the doctor took a look at it, and they realized that it had grown. He was rushed into hospital, they did tests, and very quickly they gave the diagnosis. He had sarcoma, a form of cancer. Now, the doctors acted really quickly. They removed it. They gave him radiotherapy, and wonderfully, he's now clear of cancer. We need to realize that when we think that our life can be sorted out by simply getting the the job or the new relationship or the better health that we desire, we are treating sarcoma as if it was saddle sore. We are seeking to build our lives, our identity on something other than Jesus, and it will, it will let us down. Horribly. We need to go to the root of the problem. We need to hear Jesus' astonishing diagnosis on our lives. We have shattered our relationship with God. Our biggest problem, all of our biggest problems, is sin. Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. But I guess that raises the question, well, who on earth is Jesus? say that. But that's what the teachers of the law are saying in verse 6. Now, if we're familiar with the gospel accounts, we we know that the teachers of the law, they they are the real baddies, okay? They're the pantomime villains. When they turn up and say something, you know it's a bad thing, okay? So we read verse 6 and we think, well, this is just them being baddies. But actually, what they're saying is entirely appropriate. It's incredibly reasonable. They have a point here. Uh, Simon Weissenthal is a Holocaust survivor. This is him. In 1941, he was captured in Poland, and he was sent to the Janowska concentration camp. Uh, One day, he was taken with a group of other men from the camp, and he was taken out to a nearby hospital, and he was tasked with removing all of the rubbish from the operating theatre. But one of the nurses, she came up to him and she said, "Um, are you a Jew? He said, yeah, yeah, I am. She said, would you mind following me? And so she took him up the corridor, up a long winding staircase and into this small room, a quiet room. And there lying in the bed was a pale, anemic man. He was covered in bandages. The only bits of his skin you could see were the hole was cut round for his mouth and his eyes. Weissenthal sat on the man's bed and the man began to talk. He said, I have not much longer to live. I am resigned to dying soon, but before that, I want to talk about an experience which is torturing. The man, his name turned out to be Carl. He'd been a member of the SS. As he lay on that bed, he was just 21. And he began to describe how he'd been stationed on the Russian front. And one day, he and the members of his platoon, they stumbled across 200 men, women, and children. And they discovered that these men, women, and children were Jews. And so they rounded them up. They pushed them into a house. They barricaded the door. They poured on gasoline, and then they threw grenades in. And as the flames started, as people tried to jump from window, they opened fire on everyone trying to leave. And there were no survivors. Carl ended like this. He said, in the long nights while I've been waiting for death, time and again I have longed to talk about it to a Jew and beg forgiveness from him. I know what I am asking is almost too much for you, but without your answer, I cannot die in peace. Carl wanted forgiveness from Weissenthal on behalf of those he'd killed. Weissenthal heard this. He stood up. 
He looked down at Carl, turned around, and walked out. You see, he could not forgive Carl because he thought he had no right, no authority to forgive the horrible offenses that Carl had committed against entirely other people. The question Weizenthal was wrestling with is the very question that the teachers of the law are asking in verses 6 and 7. What right have you got, Jesus, to forgive sin? What right? They realize the only person who has the right to forgive sins is the person who has been sinned against. Now, now in Jewish law, the priests could pronounce forgiveness of sins. But when they did it, they were doing it on behalf of God. You see, God, God has authority to forgive. Because he is the one who has created everything, which means that he owns everything. Which means that whenever we sin, no matter who we have sinned against horizontally, every time we sin, we're sinning vertically against God. He's the one who owns the one we sin against. Therefore, God alone has authority to forgive. Yet here, in verse 5, Jesus seems to be claiming that authority for himself. And the teacher of the law say, who do you think you are? There's only two options. Either Jesus is God in human flesh, or he is an evil blasphemer. Jesus claims astonishing authority for himself. People sometimes say, yeah, I, I see why you Christians like Jesus. Jesus, Jesus was a, an amazing moral teacher, possibly the best moral teacher the world has ever seen. But he never actually claimed to be God. But where did he claim to be God? I don't want to say what. Everywhere in a gospel account, and nowhere more than this. Jesus claims to have the astonishing authority of God himself, the authority to forgive sin. But can he prove it? Can he prove it? That, that's the question addressed in verses 8 to 12. Jesus sees their hearts in verse 8. So again, that's something that only God can do. And he asks this question in verse 9. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up, take your mat and walk? Now that, that is a great question. If you read the Bible commentaries, you'll, you'll see that that is a question that we still don't know how to answer today. 2,000 years, people have been reading this passage, and we still don't know which is easier. Because on the one hand, on the one hand, anyone can say your sins are forgiven. That's easy, isn't it? You don't really need to prove anything. But it's far harder to make a paralyzed man get up, take his mat, and walk away. That, that seems far harder to do. But you know, on the other hand, saying your sins are forgiven is almost impossibly difficult. What do I mean? Well, the word used here for forgiveness in verse 5, 7, 9, and 10, it's an interesting word in the original Greek. It's the word athemi. And more literally, it means to release from debt. To release from debt. You see, when you sin, you do someone harm. So imagine after the service, we're out in a collier room. I'm there, I'm enjoying a nice cup of tea, a nice cupcake, okay? And you come along and you've been unhappy with me, and so you give me a good slap around the face, okay? Imagine that, it's shocking. I'm hurt. You've done me harm. You have shamed me, and injustice has been done. How can that be put right? Well, well I can slap you back, can't I? That would release your debts. You'd now not owe me because I would owe you an equal amount. But the alternative is that I could absorb your debt. I could decide that I will pay, that I will take the shame, that I will take 
the pain. I can forgive you. You know, forgiveness always, always, always costs. Someone always has to pay. And you see, that is why it is harder to say your sins are forgiven than to say take up your mat and walk. Any miracle worker can say take up your mat and walk. Only a saviour can say your sins are forgiven. The reason Jesus has authority, the reason Jesus has power to forgive sins is because on the cross, Jesus took the punishment for all of them. He he paid the price. He absorbed the pain. He took on himself the shame of every single one of our sins. Even Carl's sin, if he put his trust in Jesus. Even yours. Even mine. Jesus has astonishing authority to forgive sin if only we turn to him. Which creates finally an astonishing supper. Uh, Jesus returns to the Sea of Galilee, the place he'd called Simon and Andrew and James and John back in chapter one. And he's doing the same thing again. He's calling a disciple, but this one's a little bit different. If if the disciples in chapter one were kind of the roughnecks, Levi, he's the untouchable. We're told he's a tax collector. Now, when you hear tax collector, don't think respectable employee at HMRC. Levi, as a tax collector, he was working for an occupying power, the, the state of Rome. He was a traitor to Israel. And the way that he earned his money was by charging a little bit extra when people came to pay the toll on the road he stood at the booth on. So he said, a few shekels for Rome and a shekel for Levi. Levi, he was a crook. He was hated. He was despised by the people. The 21st century equivalent of Levi was Harvey Weinstein. That's the sort of disdain that Levi would have been held with. And then look what happens next. Jesus calls him to follow, and then Jesus goes back to Levi's for dinner, verse 15. And Levi invites all of his friends around, other tax collectors and sinners. Now, now we need to understand something about first century culture and conventions. You know, when we have someone round for dinner, uh, you know, we're extending friendship, we're, we're being nice, we're being kind, but, you know, it's just that. In the first century, having someone round your house for a meal was incredibly symbolic. You were aligning yourself with them. You were making common cause with them. You were saying, we are partners together. And here we find Jesus eating supper with Harvey Weinstein, Bernie Madden, and Wayne Cousin. That's what's going on. What are you doing, Jesus? Teach the Laura. This is an astonishing supper. You know, it only makes sense, this astonishing supper only makes sense if we've got our heads round the three other astonishing things we've seen in chapter two. We need to understand the astonishing diagnosis. You see, the the teachers of the law thought that the world is divided up into two different groups of people. There's the wicked people over here, the, the tax collectors and the sinners, and then there's the good people over here, which is, well, people like us. Jesus' astonishing diagnosis is that we are all in the same boat. We are all sinners in desperate need of forgiveness. And while the teachers of the law thought that they had authority to decide who could be forgiven and who couldn't, Jesus claims to have the astonishing authority to forgive every single sin, without exception. Which means that that everyone who comes to him with astonishing faith, the sort of faith that we saw that recognizes verse 
17, that we are spiritually sick. The, the sort of faith that recognizes that we're, we're in desperate need of a doctor. Everyone who comes with that sort of faith, whether it be the paralytic and his four friends, or, or whether it be Levi and his crooks, everyone is welcome to come and eat with Jesus. Why? Why? We know there's something that both the paralyzed man and Levi have in common. They're totally different in so many ways, but there's one thing that happens to both of them that is the same. I wonder if you noticed it. Verse 12 and verse 14, they both got up. Got up. Now, the word used there in the original of verse 12, it's used again 14 chapters later in Mark's gospel. When Mary arrives at the tomb, and she's told by the angel that Jesus, the one crucified three days earlier, had got up, had been raised. Because Jesus rose on that first Easter Sunday, because he dealt with the debt of sin, the sinful paralyzed man could rise from his mat and live. The sinful Levi could rise from his life of treachery and live. In just a few moments, we're going to be sharing in the Lord's Supper together. But that's Jesus. Supper. And it's an astonishing supper because it has the most astonishing guests there. Those who have accepted Jesus' astonishing diagnosis, those who know, verse 17, that they are sick. Uh, on the 16th of October, 1946, the 11 men convicted by the Nuremberg trial, all high ranking Nazi officials, they were hung for their crime. The night before they were hung, three of them, Joachim von Ribbentrop, Fritz Sauckel, and Wilhelm Keitel, they took the Lord's Supper together with the chaplain who'd been assigned to them, Henry Gerecki. Listen to how Gerecki described that moment as they took the Lord's Supper before they were hung. He said, God had changed these hearts along the way and now, in the face of losing all material things, even their life, they could hear the promises of God to penitent sinners through the lips of Jesus, who receives sin-burdened soul. You know, the only qualification for coming to the table that is about to be laid out here, the only qualification is recognizing that you are a sinner in desperate need of Jesus' grace. If that is you today, then Jesus' arms, they are open wide to you, and he says, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Come eat. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this promise of free and total and complete forgiveness of sins. Thank you that there is nothing more to be done, nothing left. You have both the authority and the power to forgive sins. The punishment is taken. The price has been paid. The shame has been borne. And now we can stand before you and we can eat with you as those clothed in your righteousness, as those called sons and daughters of the living God. Amen.